Hello, I'm Meredith Blackwell, and this is Don Feaster, and we're here doing the oral history for mycology project. We're at the University of Florida campus in the Hilton Hotel for the Mycological Society meeting, uh, Mycological Society of America meeting. And today is the 12th of July, 2022, and we're going to interview Alden Dirk. So, Alden, I, I know a lot about you, in, uh, uh, at least from the past, because you were in the, the lab and took my course and so forth. But I, we, we want to hear about how you kind of got into mycology, where you, where you are from, uh, where you did college work and so forth, with the idea that we're, we're kind of sampling the uh, the population here to find out what the influences are and how people are, are working in the field. So you're, you're new to uh, professional mycology, but why don't you get us started here? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely got excited about mushrooms starting with um, eating them. Uh, <laughs> I grew up eating mushrooms. I think I grew up in a non-mycophobic household. So in college studying biology, at some point I was exposed to um, king trumpets and hen of the woods, and they were delicious. And I learned that you could find them in the woods. Uh, doing some online searching, I found the cover of David Aurora's All That the Rain Promises and More. And I was like, this is interesting. <laughs> Someone has a trombone or a trumpet or whatever with this big flush of mushrooms coming out of the woods. And so I like that. So I went out into the woods and started collecting mushrooms. And one thing led to another. Um, the first thing I tried eating was Berkeley's polypore, thinking it was chicken of the woods. And that <laughs> was fine. Nothing bad happened, but it was not edible. And then after that, um, various things, situations brought me to work at Harvard. But you were at Swarthmore. Yes, I was at Swarthmore College studying biology. So the, the culinary aspect of mushrooms quickly turned into an interest in the, in the biology and ecology and taxonomy. Um, and so are you from Pennsylvania or? Yes, from Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia region. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So went to Harvard, was working in the lab of Nomi Pierce, a greenhouse there working with butterflies. And, but I, I couldn't be kept away from mycology. So you graciously allowed me to audit your course, which was a huge, a huge yeah, lesson and great introduction to mycology. Um, simultaneously, I was going out in forays with the Boston Mycological Club. Um, Larry Millman was a mentor at the time, kind of showing me some more obscure fungi in the area. And then that led to me working with Danny Hillwaters, who was a grad student in your lab at the time, on a biodiversity survey of the Boston Harbor Islands. That's where I know your name from. That's what it is. Yeah, so that was a really exciting project, going out on these landing crafts, these different islands, and just collecting any mushrooms, any fungi that we found, and coming back, getting introduced to sequencing and barcoding. At that point, I was definitely hooked, so decided to go on to graduate school. And, and. <laughs> where and was that? That brought me to University of Wisconsin Madison, where I joined the agroecology program. In your class, we talked about our muscular mycorrhizal fungi and their role in plant health, symbiosis, particularly in agricultural crops, and that really excited me. So I wanted to delve into that world of AMF in agriculture, which got me working with. Um, switchgrass, it's a perennial grass that's used in biofuel production. Looking at the community composition of AMF associating with switchgrass across different nitrogen addition regimens. And that was further work into the um, DNA of fungi, doing some ITS metabarcoding of AMF communities and experimenting with some Pacific Biosciences long RDNA amplicons. So that was a lot of fun. Um, after that experience, I realized I wanted uh, a real intense mycological education. 
And so I was seeking at that time a mentor who was a mycologist because I was working in an ecology lab at the time. Who were, were you working with? Dr. Randy Jackson, okay. um, a grassland ecologist. So I moved to University of Michigan to join the lab of Professor Tim James. And it was not my top choice, but I met, um, it wasn't on my radar until I went to a Smith foray, an annual Smith foray in the Midwestern region. And I met Tim and the lab and I just thought it was suddenly a great option for me. So talked more with Tim and then one thing led to another, I, I joined the James lab. And that's been a really nice home where I have learned um, and that, that, that lab really embraces genomic technologies and sequencing. And I've, further, I've gone further down that route, which has led to a PhD project focused on the genetics and evolution of the gyometrin mycotoxin yeah. in false morales or lorchelles. Mm -hmm. um, so and today I'm presenting a poster on my first chapter, which is looking at the distribution of gyometrin production in the lorchell family. So no chytrids. <laughs> no chytrids. I'm an anomaly in the lab, but chytrids are amazing organisms. And as a side project, I am pretty fascinated by um, a chytrid named Sorochytrium monesiopthera. And it's a chytrid that infects tardigrades. It was described. Oh, wow. Yeah, the only chytrid known to How do that. Obscure. Yeah. <laughs> Collected in the and described in the 1970s. So, and I have. I've attempted, I've gone to the type locale in West Virginia, uh, Appalachian State University, I think it is. I've gone to the wall outside the library where the moss was collected and the tar grade was isolated. And I did not find it, but it is an ongoing interest. And recently we were sent some samples from Finland where someone found some chytrid-like organisms infecting some tardigrades. So, um, so not, quite, not all the way tardigrades, but they're definitely fascinating and interesting. So, so the, the exact one you were working on hasn't been found again? It has never been found. It's not, we don't have it in culture. We don't have any sequence data. It's a mono-specific um, family, the Sorochytriaceae and the Blastocladia mycota. So there's a lot unknown about that, okay. that clade. So it's thought to have a life cycle that's more complex than we usually think of? Um, I don't think we know very much. We know that it affects tardigrades, it insists and produces the zoospores, um, and it can grow in culture. But yeah, maybe then it just comes back around, finds another tardigrade, and restarts. But uh, we don't know too much yeah. about it. That's the beauty of fungi, isn't it? That there's always something A to mystery find. to solve. Yeah, the, and the more mycology I do, the more humbling it all is. Uh, for example, just doing work right now with secondary metabolites of Diametrian, um, exploring what the genes might be that are producing that mycotoxin, and discovering that these genomes across the family, each one contains up to a dozen biosynthetic gene clusters, and none of them are characterized. So in this one family, there might be hundreds of undescribed, uncharacterized chemicals, secondary metabolites being produced. And then I just amplify that out, extend it out to all the other fungi, the millions of fungi that we have not described yet. Uh, so it's truly humbling <laughs> to know, yeah, how little we actually know about fungi currently. Humbling and exciting. Yeah, yeah. good. So what's your, I, I forget what year you are in graduate school. Just finished my third year of a PhD program, so entering my fourth year. And so what, what's your goal? Um, my goal is currently, I think I would like to become a mushroom farmer. <laughs> uh, I love, yeah, the intersection of agriculture and mycology, and I would love to be in a position where I was bringing some of these delicious mushrooms that I've enjoyed from the woods into cultivation, um, and we can add a greater diversity of fungi to, to people's diets. And there's a whole bunch of them to explore in terms of cultivation. And that could connect with the work I'm doing currently with, with Lord Charles, so we'll see. So I'm interested in your family. Had they had instruction on identification of mushrooms? No, no. Did I grow up with like, yeah, yeah. no. Um, interestingly, I grew up eating a, it's called macrobiotics, uh, which is a, from Japan, a diet derived from Japan. So we ate a lot of Japanese inspired food, which included a lot of shiitakes, um, perhaps before they were more common and mainstream. 
and a lot of other mushrooms. So okay, but they were bought. Yeah, they were bought. You know, in terms of foraging or wild identification, that wasn't part of my life until I got interested in college. I was a little concerned. <laughs> Yeah, it, didn't you do a little survey of the mushrooms on on Swarthmore campus? Wasn't there something about that? You know, I've started and stopped projects um, as I've learned what it takes to actually complete a project. So I, I could have started some sort of biodiversity survey, which I definitely get excited about. And um, but yeah, mycology requires learning over time, requires a lot of work to really bring a project to culmination. and it's very valuable to bring it to culmination. Um, but I, I did get interested at the time as well, I should mention, in crust fungi, which led to me making a website that is, hasn't been updated too recently, but crustfungi.com. Um, and that came about through meeting Karen Nakasone at the Forest Products Lab and learning from her just extraordinary talent and expertise as a corticiologist about these super diverse, interesting organisms that we don't know too much about ecologically and taxonomically. I, I learned how, I used to work with her advisor, uh, Bob Gilbertson. And so it was really, diff those are difficult fungi. And I think I'm remembering also where I've heard your name. Do you know Bill Sheehan? Yes. Yeah, because Bill Sheehan was talking about how you could identify corticioids. <laughs> Yeah, they're fine. You get down into the microscopic realms. They're really nice ones, some of them. Yeah. So I want to ask you another thing. Is there anyone at uh, Swarthmore now doing fungi? Not that I know of. Do you know the rich history? Say, going back maybe 50, 60 years? Of Swarthmore biology? Uh, well, mycology. I don't. Sounds like you might know I'll something. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I do. No, there was a, a man no. there named... Huh? Crumb? No. Okay. That there no, may have there. been. There may have been. <laughs> Do you know anything about crumb? About crumb. He suggested maybe crumb. Which crumb? <laughs> Howard crumb? I don't know. There's some crumb woods, and I think I've seen crumb on some um, yeah. labeling. Well, I, I, I'm no. thinking of Bill Dennison. Yeah, that's the one I'm okay. thinking of. He's yeah. the first I know of, and he he went from Swarthmore. Well, first of all, he had an undergraduate student called George Carroll. And he used to take them down into, where did they go on their field They trips? went to Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was a big project in Costa Rica, and they were collecting dyspomycetes. Uh, that was his specialty. He worked with Dick Korff, who was also my advisor, but he was one of Korff's first students. And he was at Swarthmore for quite a long time. Yeah. And then Well, then what happened was George Carroll interviewed at both Oregon and Oregon State. And he was offered both jobs. And he um, decided to go to Oregon, University of Oregon. And uh, that left a mycologist wanting at uh, Oregon State. And he recommended Bill Dennison. Yeah, and, and Bill went there. He worked on these tropical things, uh, but he, in those Costa Rican days. Uh, his thesis was on Scutulinia. Okay. Uh, but he did a number of things, and then he got into the uh, kind of e uh, lichens and ecosystem, and uh, they did tree climbing and so forth out in Oregon, trying to look at biomass and turnover and nitrogen cycles and so forth. And George is a distinguished mycologist of the society. And he is one of the first people who showed uh, the wealth of uh, all of the um, endophytes, in, not the grass endophytes, but the others that are in, in uh, both conifers and broadleaf plants. Yeah. yeah. So th there is a history there at Swarthmore. It kind of got ended. <laughs> it ended, yes. <laughs> Which is a shame. But yeah, super interesting. Didn't know anything about that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and George retired a few years ago, but he's still doing some mycology, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, any advice for your fellow students? Hmm. Um, any advice? You know, something I've been appreciating recently, and this advice is maybe easier said than done, is just 
yeah, the collaborations that come about through through mycological research, um, but the confidence that is built by just trying something. And a PhD is a long journey, um, but it's invaluable to get confidence in whatever techniques you're working with. And there can be a lot of just paralysis in trying to try something new, um, but I guess it's okay to fail and just keep trying. And, and in the failing, you're learning something new. And having learning from people directly, from more experienced colleagues, is just the best way. So we've just come out of two years of a pandemic. Um, so it's really nice to reconnect with people in person, both like the social engagements and the, the co-learning and teaching is really valuable that way. <laughs>